Well, that's all I got. Any questions? <laughs> nah, I'm kidding. I have slides. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Good evening. My name's Eric Roper. I'm a mission manager for Orbital ATK on the NASA Sounding Rocket Operations Contract. And I'm here to talk to you tonight about the life cycle of a sounding rocket. So first off, what is a sounding rocket? I didn't know until I started working here what a sounding rocket was. The term sounding is actually the, term, the determination of any physical property or de at a depth or at a height in the atmosphere or in our case in space. Uh, we launch a lot of payloads up that go outside of the atmosphere. But the term sounding comes from uh, the original uh, inception of the sounding rocket program. It used to be a Navy program. The inception was back in 1959 is when it was first started. There have been approximately 3,000 missions flown for, uh, on the sounding rocket platform. In the past 20 years, we have had an average success rate of about 90, over 90%. The launch vehicle, which is actually just the motor stack, is over 97% success rate. Uh, in the mid-1980s, the sounding rocket program was consolidated to Wallops Flight Facility. Now, who uses sounding rockets? Well, sounding rockets are a niche platform. They, they're kind of unique. So Wallops has all these other platforms like aircraft. You, the P-3 flies to uh, Antarctica or out to Iceland or Greenland and does some sonar and things like that. So they get really, you know, from the ground up and below the ground up to a certain altitude. The C-130 goes up and does other uh, alti uh, mid to high altitude experiments. Balloons go up to just the edge of space, flying long-term telescopes and things like that. Satellites, they go way out 600 kilometers and more. Well, there's a void in between 600 kilometers and where balloons are that we don't really get good scientific data. Sounding rockets can reach that altitude, that range of altitude. So they launch from different uh, launch ranges around the globe like Norway, uh, Alaska, different places like White Sands, New Mexico. We launch a lot of telescopes from White Sands, New Mexico. We launch from Kwajalein. There's actually a campaign headed out there right now to launch uh, a couple water recovered telescopes to look at targets that we can't see in the Northern Hemisphere. Then we have uh, different DOD contracts that will actually go out and use us for different uh, experiments. One uh, notable experiment that we did with the Air Force Research Lab is we launched a payload that dumped some aerium into the atmosphere to change the ionospheric density and they shot at it with uh, high frequency radio waves to see how it changed and deflected so that as the sun rises it makes our ionosphere plasma do all these different uh, crazy uh, waves and density changes as the sun goes up or as the earth rotates and the sunlight hits the different parts of the atmosphere and they wanted to know how that affected radio transmissions so that's one way that they tested that uh, we have this one group called the sounding rocket working group it's a group of experimenters scientists universities they come together with nasa headquarters and they talk about how to they plan out and do uh, sounding rocket campaigns and missions. So how does it all fit together? So we have really three organizations involved. We have NASROC, which is the contract with Orbital ATK, LJT, Hawk, and Hammers. And then we have NASA, who is the oversight. And then we have the principal investigator, who's really the customer. Uh, from the orbital ATK standpoint, we have two customers. We have NASA and we have the principal investigator. So what happens is the principal investigator gives us requirements for their rocket and we build the rocket for them. So they get the product. 
NASA provides funding and oversight for both us and the principal investigator, but what they get in return is services rendered from us and they get scientific returns from the principal investigator. Sounding rockets are responsible for a lot of PhD uh, theses and different graduations. We have also been, uh, we've also validated satellite tracking and instrumentation, served as a test bed for spacecraft and space station components. One of the most notable ones we're doing right now is we're actually launching rockets to test the supersonic parachute that they're gonna to use to land on Mars. So those are, that's one mission that launched last year and they're queued up again to launch again this year. <clears throat> so how does it all begin? How does the process start? The process starts when a scientist or principal investigator gets a proposal selected by NASA. NASA selects the proposal and says, okay, we will give you the funding to launch this rocket. So then they come to us and say, they have a mission initiation conference or a MIC as we lovingly call it. It's pretty much a giant science fair project. They sit and talk about science. It's way above my head and I don't understand. And all I really want to know is how high do you want to go? How long do you want to stay up there? Things like that. But there's some really interesting things that they do that I can glean from that. Uh, the biggest part of the science of the uh, MIC conference is the PI presents their experiments, what they look like, what they want to do, and their goals, the scientific requirements. So they'll communicate the launch range they want to launch from, the altitudes they want to reach, the telemetry that they need, telemetry being what's communicated back to the ground. And then they tell us how big of a battery do they want and other special requests like we only have to launch, we, need, we can only launch if our instrument's at minus 40 degrees Celsius or something like that. So we have to figure out how to cool their instrument. <clears throat> What's next? Well, once we have gotten all of their requests, the mission manager will sit down with them and develop requirements. It's more of a functional list, okay? What do you want from sounding rockets to give to you. And what we do is we let, uh, lay out, okay, we want to get recovered and we want to launch from White Sands. Okay, well, you're going to need a parachute. We need to talk with the Army and get Black Hawk helicopters to go pick it up and bring it back. And then we lay out all those requirements and we list everything out so that we can take and build the base to our pyramid. So requirements, validation, design, develop, test, and deploy. That's pretty much our process. And so the requirements, as you can see, is the base or the foundation of the whole process. If you don't have strong requirements, you're not going to have a very strong product. So that requirements definition meeting is very important to lay out the baseline of the design. Then what? The design review. Once we have laid out the requirements, we've gone through the design process, the mechanical engineers designed the hardware, the electrical engineers designed all the telemetry, the power, the uh, data lines, all of that. How are we getting all this information to the payload and back to the ground? And uh, we've got the launch vehicle engineers have picked the proper launch platform to get us to where we want to be. And the, uh, um, who else? ACS, if we have attitude control. Attitude control is where, it's not really what you do to your kids. Uh, it's kind of the same thing, but you want to point in the right direction. So attitude is your relative uh, location in space relative to some datum, which our datum is Earth, or if we're pointing at the, uh, if we're pointing at a celestial body, we use what's called J2000 coordinates. Um, but ACS, you know, an ACS, if you've ever seen Apollo 13 and you see how they're trying to maneuver the, uh, the lander or they're trying to maneuver the pod and you see all the little puffs of white gas that's nitrogen or argon, we use that same exact system to point our rockets. For our telescopes, if we're looking up at a 
star or if we're wanting to even look at our sun. We have a couple of telescopes that look at the sun and calibrate some satellites that are flying around Earth. If we want to look at that target, we have to be able to point to it. So we use argon gas or nitrogen gas to point to the target and it can hold it to within plus or minus one or two arc seconds, which an arc second, there are 60 arc minutes in a degree and then 60 arc seconds in an arc minute. So we're talking really, 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 really small pointing maneuvers. But when you're looking at something that's a million light years away, you want to be that accurate because if you're a degree off, you might not even be looking in the right area. But we go through that entire design process and then we get to the design review. And no, we don't use Kerbal to design our rockets, even though it is fun to design rockets in Kerbal Space Program. Uh, but the design team presents their design to a panel of uh, peers for review. The panel is chaired by the chief engineer or the engineering manager or a senior mission manager. And the panel assigns action items on how to improve that design or places where they may have not met a certain requirement. And from that, once all of those are all the actions have been compiled and answered, we move into the fabrication phase, which looks something like this. This is where we actually cut metal, wire things, put everything together. Once we have everything put together and we've done some preliminary inspections, we inspect all the pieces as they come out of the shop, we actually take all those pieces and put them together to make sure they fit. We go into what's called the pre-integration review. Now integration from our standpoint is where the experiment, experimenter is going to show up with their equipment and they want to be able to just plug into our equipment and start testing. So what we have to do is we have to go into in front of our management and say, okay, we fit checked all of our stuff, all our stuff works, it fits together, we plugged it in, nothing blew up, nothing got caught on fire, everything's playing nice, we're ready for the experiment team to show up. That's the purpose of the pre-integration review. Of course, that's the perfect pre-integration review, you know, so we actually will get I, uh, action items assigned from the PIR to where we want, you know, the, our management will say, we're a little worried about this. We'd like for you to kind of get onto this and make sure that this does work before the experiment team shows up. And so that's, uh, and that's where you can see how here we have uh, a mechanical technician, an electrical technician. We've got this experiment structure laid out and they're getting ready to plug it into our telemetry system that we've furnished. So right before we start mating connectors of the uh, experiment section, we want to make sure that all our stuff works first. So that if there's a problem, it's a lot easier to pinpoint when, uh, it's a lot easier to pinpoint where the problem is if we know that our stuff works first. Next, we have experiment integration and testing. This is where we finally put everything together and we start testing it out in our environmental lab. Basically, we try to break it. First thing you see here is dynamic balance. So our rockets are spun stabilized. So they spin like a bullet or an arrow. And in order for them to spin properly, just like your tire, you've got to balance them to where they don't wobble. So that's what this operation is here.
mass properties measurement. When you're launching a rocket, you want to know where your center of gravity is, which if you've ever taken a pencil and balanced it on your finger, that's known as the center of gravity. You want to know where that is because the center of gravity relative to the other properties of the rocket is very sensitive. If you have it too far forward or too far aft, it will actually cause instability in the rocket. Static loads testing, also known as the bend test. We literally take the payload, which is just the nose cone down to where it interfaces with the rocket motors, bolt it to the floor and push on it. See how much it bends. Because we fly needles. Everybody's favorite test, the vibration test. The vibration test is where we shake bolts and different things loose and really scary experimenters, especially the guys that are flying telescopes with big million dollar mirrors. This is where we shake them and try. 23.8 G sign. We're not trying to break them, but we're trying to break them. Okay. This is a unique test. We don't do this a lot. But Two, it kind of shows you how violent a, uh, a vibration test can be. And some of our rockets have pieces that come off. Two, and so we test them one, to make sure that those zero. pieces come off properly. Uh, a lot of the pieces use springs, but when we're doing deployments, we'll hang them upside down and let gravity do the deployment because we don't want 2,000 pounds worth of springs throwing those one off. And these are different booms. When you have uh, ion gauges or things of that nature that you want to take ion measurements with, you don't want them close to the payload because the payload gives off its own ion signature. So you get them out as far away as possible. And these are, this is a simultaneous uh, deployment. Our T and E guys are really good at coming up with stuff. Those booms are 30 foot from one end to the other. They're wire booms. And uh, we uh, lovingly call this experiment the turkey pot experiment because the experimenter, when he first showed up, couldn't quite figure out the right drum diameter that he needed to wrap those experiments those booms around. So he went to Walmart Pokemon and found the pot that was the right size. So now, the joke is, every time he sends his experiment to us, it's in that same box that he bought that pot out of. So now we call it the turkey pot. This is magnetic calibration. We fly magnetometers, which actually uh, can sense magnetism, as the name implies. We can take and null out the Earth's magnetic field in this building. This building is made out of wood, fiberglass, and aluminum. There are actually aluminum nails nailed into those handrails. Now, I don't know about you guys, but have you ever tried to drive a 16-penny nail into a board and bend it? Try driving an aluminum nail into a board and not bending it. But uh, what they do is they'll actually null out the Earth's magnetic field, induce their own magnetic fields into it, measure the response from the magnetometer, then they calibrate it, and then we actually accurately know what the Earth's magnetic field looks like, and we can take that information and know pretty accurately where we were on the globe when we were flying. So is there an end? Yes, there's an end. We're getting there, I promise. The mission readiness review. Once we get done with all the testing and everything like that, we have another review, because we really love meetings. So what we'll do is we will have the mission readiness review. Basically, we present all of our test results to that same panel of peers, and we tell them these are the test re results we got. If anything happened, we tell them what we fixed. We tell them what we changed since the design review, because naturally, as you're going through the building process, there's some things you realize you could have done better, so you change those. All of that is documented in the mission readiness review. We take the actions from that review, compile them together, answer those. Some of them are, you know, this bolt broke, so we 
glued the head of the bolt back on there just for aesthetics. Okay, don't do that. Pull that bolt off. It's okay. It'll fly fine or things like that. Um, and then after that, we have the authorization to proceed and the flight readiness review. This is more of a high level review with the mission manager and the upper management. And what they do here is they talk, we talk through the risks of the experimenter. The experimenter says, I accept the risks on this mission. Uh, they say, we're all ready to fly. So this is a flight readiness review. It's literally the last meeting before we light the fuse. So next, finally, launch. That's not what I wanted you to do. And this is everybody's favorite part. Some of these rockets you'll actually see a small flame shoot out the side in opposite directions. That's on purpose. We have these motors called spin motors. And this is also my favorite one. Slow motion of the rocket blowing through a styrofoam box. But those spin motors, if a rocket is too big and it won't spin up right off the launch rail, we use those motors to spin it up so it stays stable. So to kind of give you an idea of why that box stayed together so well, it's because that happened in like six hundredths of a second. But wait, there's more. There's always more. So after all the excitement, all the fun, the rockets off the ground, everybody's happy. We've actually had some experimenters cry in the blockhouse because they worked their entire career to get this data and they finally see exactly what they wanted to see. It's always paperwork. So at the end, we have data reviews, anomaly investigations. If there's something that went wrong on the rocket, and we need to determine what happened so that future rockets don't have that same problem. We have investigations. And then, of course, my favorite, the mission closeout report. That's where all the departments get all their data together and they put it into a final report. And then we give that to NASA and then NASA says, OK, this mission's done. And they also get all the financial reports and everything like that. But before I uh, open it up to questions, I'd like to thank the uh, NASA Visitor Center for allowing me to come here, uh, Orbital ATK for also allowing me to come here, the Sounding Rocket Program, the Photo Lab, and Barrett Bland for the awesome pictures and videos that I got. Uh, that first video that I showed when everybody got here, that was done by the Photo Lab. They did an awesome job.